In the previous video, we've talked about the complex valued square root and the, the Riemann surface. But remember, what we were actually discussing was singularities. And so far, we haven't seen any singularity. Everything was nicely well behaved, finite, continuous. So where do the singularities come from in the case of the complex valued square root? Well, the singularities actually come from the fact uh, that we as humans have a desire to make that multi-valued function into a single valued function. Because it's so much more convenient if you have a calculator or a computer function and you give it a certain complex number to calculate the square root of, that you only get a single number back when you press the button or when you call a function. So what people do is they take this complex valued square root and they make it into a single valued function by conventionally saying we're only going to look at solutions where the real part of the result is positive. So if you look into the w plane, so remember w is z to the power of one half, we're actually going to say everything where we have a real part of w which is negative, we're going to throw that away. And we're only going to look at solutions in this right half plane here. Now, what sort of, of an effect does that have on the function as a whole? So let's take this step by step and let's try to investigate what happens to the boundary between these two parts. So the boundary here is where we have the real part of, uh, of W being equal to zero. So if we have real part of W being equal to zero in the W plane, what does that correspond to in the Z plane, in the input plane? So z is w squared. So pause the video and try to figure out what this structure maps to in the z plane. Now the boundary here in the w plane is purely imaginary. So we have that w is actually equal to plus or minus jv with v a positive number. And then if you move that to the z plane, so remember z is w squared, this will actually give you z equal to minus v squared, so the negative real axis. In fact, this part over here with positive values of the imaginary part will map to the negative real axis over here. But similarly also this part will again map to the, the same structure. So it's sort of like that fold it onto itself and, and collapses. Okay, now this line in the input domain here in the, the Z plane, which starts at the origin and runs to minus infinity along the negative real axis, this line is called the branch cut of our square root. And again, the branch cut comes from the fact that we as humans decide to throw away this part here of our solution space. So this is the branch cut, and the branch cut originates at a certain point, which is called the branch point. So this is the branch point, this is the branch cut, and if you want, you could also say that there's a second branch point at, uh, at minus infinity. Do these things correspond to singularities? Well, they indeed correspond to problematic points, because as we will verify in just a moment, the function is no longer continuous if you cross uh, the branch cut. So this is going to be our next task. We're going to calculate the square root, complex valued square root of a point just above our branch cut. So let's call this z plus. And then let's also calculate the square root of z minus just below uh, the branch cut here. So pause the video and calculate the square roots of these two points. Of course, bearing in mind that we're only interested in solutions in this right half plane over here. Right, so again, we will need to look at the representation in polar form. So for z plus, we're going to write that as rho exponential j. Well, and then in terms of angle, what we have for an angle here is we have an angle which is almost pi, but not quite. If we're just above the branch cut here, we're going to say that our angle here is pi minus epsilon for z plus. When we calculate the solution, let's call that one w plus, we just take the real valued square root of the modulus and then the argument we divide that by 2. 
So we have exponential j pi over 2 minus epsilon over 2. So that's an angle which is just below 90 degrees in the w plane. So if we're looking over here, this will be a point, let's say that's a point over here. So this is going to be w plus. Obviously, if we take the limit of epsilon going towards zero, this will end up in the point square root of rho and then times exponential j pi over two. So that's just j. Okay, so that's z plus. Let's now move to z minus. That's going to be a point which has an argument which is a little bit higher than pi because we just move on over here. Okay, now if we do it like that, if we write down a polar form like this and naively we try to calculate w minus just by having our recipe to half the angle, then we end up with something like this which is a point which has a, uh, an angle which is just above pi over 2 in the w plane. So this will be a point that's over here. Unfortunately, that takes us in the forbidden zone. So actually, we should have a different solution, namely minus this thing. So we should have a solution for w minus, which is actually over here. So the way we do that is by having a minus sign here or multiplying by exponential j pi. Because again, we can add any multiple of 2 pi over here uh, to have the same points in the z-plane. But if we then divide that 2 pi by 2, then we get exponential j pi for a minus sign. So for both of these uh, z values, z plus and z minus, we have two solutions. But we only pick the solution in uh, the right half plane. So obviously, that guy originally here also had a different brother over there. But again, of these solutions, we only pick this guy. And likewise, for z minus of these two possible solutions, we only pick that guy over there. Now, in the limit of epsilon to zero, this thing goes to square root of rho, and then we have minus j. So the important message here is that even though z plus and z minus are lying infinitely close together, and you can continuously walk in the z plane from z plus to z minus, if you look at what's happening in the output domain, in the W plane, then you have a discontinuous jump because you jump from this thing over here to that solution over there. If we hadn't made our function single valued, if we were just walking around the extended Riemann surface, then we could just keep on continuously evolving this point over here to that point over there, and there would be no issue whatsoever with continuity. Now what we've done is we have thrown away the left part here of that, uh, of that diagram. So if we interpret that in terms of Riemann surface, so here we have back our, our Riemann surface, what we've done is we've taken this very beautiful, intricate mathematical structure and we've basically mutilated it by taking scissors and cutting that Riemann surface over here into two what are then called Riemann sheets. So we have one Riemann sheet on the top here and one Riemann sheet on the bottom, and you're basically throwing away everything in the bottom over here. Which also means that if you start from a point over here, whereas previously you could start in the gray zone and then keep continuously evolving in the gray zone over here, that's now no longer going to be possible in our mutilated version of the square root, in our single-valued version of the square root. So we cannot do that. We need to start here in the gray zone, and then as soon as we hit the branch cut, we need to jump to the blue zone over here, which is clearly a discontinuous evolution. So another way of drawing that is by explicitly writing down these two Riemann sheets. So uh, for the first Riemann sheet, let's say that we have, for example, uh, let's call this point here in the blue part B. I'm not sure how readable that is, so that, that's B here. And then we have a point A in the gray zone. Then the consequence of taking our scissors to the Riemann surface will be that we have a first Riemann sheet that we will keep on the left. And then we have a second Riemann sheet on the right that we throw away. And then the point A here in the gray will correspond to a point A here in the other gray zone in the second, the lower Riemann surface. So these two points labeled A correspond together. And then the 
point B here is glued to that point B in the second uh, Riemann sheet. We could say that we only keep the, the left part where the argument actually runs from minus pi to pi. So we have minus pi for B and pi for A. Indeed, if we look here for B, that corresponds to an angle of minus pi. And if we move to A, that corresponds to an angle of pi. And you could say that the second Riemann sheet, which we throw away, in that case, normally the angle would, uh, would continue from pi to three pi, but that part we just uh, throw away. So we've mutilated our very beautif beautiful complex valued square roots into a structure uh, which only has a single solution, but the price we pay for that single solution is the fact that we now have a discontinuity if we jump across the Riemann, uh, uh, across the, the branch cut. And that's of course problematic if you want to evaluate contour integrals. So say you have our function over here with our branch cut. What you certainly cannot do is have a contour which drives straight through your branch cut if you want to apply all the theorems that we've seen before. Because the theorems rely on the fact that the function has no singularities, that the function is nicely well behaved and holomorphic slash analytic. It should certainly be continuous, so therefore branch cut, that's, that's a no-go. What you can do if you're dealing with a branch cut is you can sort of like skirt around the edges like so. You can have a contour like this, which nicely sidesteps the branch cut here in this Pac-Man-like fashion. Um, that's, that's perfectly fine. However, what you shouldn't do then is make the mistake that saying, okay, this part over here and that part over there, in the limits, they will become infinitely close together and they will cancel. We've done uh, an argument like that when we were trying to prove Cauchy's uh, theorem, for example, then we said, okay, this guy becomes infinitely close to that guy, and therefore these contributions cancel. They canceled in this case because here we're dealing with a continuous function. They will not cancel in that case because we have different values of on different sides of the, the branch cut. So, so don't, uh, don't do that. Final thing I want to mention is answering the question, yeah, what's now so special about choosing the real part of W positive as a way to make our function single valued? And the answer is nothing special whatsoever. So if you wanted, you could just as well have said, okay, I'm only going to keep solutions where let's say the imaginary part of W is negative. So that should be creative. That's certainly possible. However, what happens from time to time is there are physical reasons that will dictate the choice of branch cut. So just to give you an example from electromagnetism, if you have a plane wave, which is propagating with exponential minus KZZ, for example, and you have a propagation constant here. So you all know that a propagation constant uh, KZ that can be written as the propagation constant in vacuum uh, squared minus, for example, another component along the x direction. If you then want to calculate kz, you should have a square root. And choosing the branch cut essentially boils down to choosing either a plus sign or a minus sign for that, uh, that square root. And physical reasons might say, OK, I want a solution where the energy decreases, or I want a solution corresponding to an outgoing wave in that case, there might be physical reasons why you want one sign over the other sign. So why you want to keep a certain solution and not, uh, not another solution. But purely mathematically speaking, you can put the branch cut everywhere you like. You can even go very crazy and let's say I have a branch cut that looks like this. That's not even straight. That's in theory possible. The only thing which a branch cut should do is it should A, make sure that you have a recipe which makes the function single valued again. And B, if you walk around without crossing the branch cut, that you just evaluate in a nice continuous uh, fashion. Okay, so these were branch cuts. And again, branch cuts, they only come because we as humans want to make our function single valued.